In the last chapter of this playlist, I explained how you can use satellite modems with inexpensive water sensors to remotely monitor drainages through the Iridium satellite network. In this chapter, we'll use a feather phona to report an analog response from our water sensor using cellular rather than satellite telemetry. To do this, we'll build upon code already developed for prior chapters in this playlist. Specifically, we'll amend that code to work with an analog sensor. On that note, let's get started. For flow detection, I'll be using these cheap water sensors available on eBay. These can be purchased from US retailers at significant markup, or if you can wait a few weeks for shipping, you can purchase these from overseas at a significant discount. For your field deployment, you'll wanna make sure you encase the sensor in some kind of housing to protect it from rain and or gravel and rocks suspended in storm flows. I've found PVC pipe to be an excellent option that's easy to work with and have included details at the end of this video. PVC pipe is good because it can be used to elevate the sensor above grade so that telemetry can be initiated when flow occurs at a given stage. Next, I'll follow up with a quick demo of this setup and the respective analog response for these water sensors. Water in the ephemeral wash starts to rise. And you can see now that the analog response on the uh, water sensor goes way up. And then when my, uh, when my stage drops in the ephemeral wash, the response goes back down. With respect to our hardware, we'll start with a circuit prepared for our Introduction to the Internet of Things video. I won't dive too deep into the circuit since it and the supporting code were covered in that video. We'll then amend it with the sensor we just described. The sensor will be powered off the power rail of your protoboard or breadboard with its signal pin attached to pin A0 on the phona. Note that this setup assumes that you're going to be powering your phona using a micro USB cable tethered to your laptop. The power will be transferred to the power rail from this USB pin on the feather phona. For field deployments, you will likely be powering your circuit using a 3.7 volt LiPo battery, which can be attached via this JST plug on the phona. In this case, the power rail will be powered off the bat pin on the feather phona. As a result, the voltage delivered to the power rail will be less than the 5 volts required for the LCD readout used in the original demonstration. This can result in the LCD dimming and becoming somewhat difficult to read. If you'd like a brighter display that will work well off a 3.7 volt power supply, you might consider these Feather OLED displays which can be stacked on the original Feather Phona, assuming you have the right headers. I recommend these for battery powered field deployments where you need a bright display, but to use these you will need to amend the code I've shared with the appropriate libraries and function calls for displaying data. In this video, I'll reference these two sketches, the first which has already been shared and demonstrated, and the second which shows the minor adjustments we need to make for integrating this or any other analog sensor into our circuit. Let's start with a code entitled Phona Barebones LCD Rev1. First, let's define some global variables that we can reference in functions for recording circuit voltage and the state of our modem. These are the variables that were discussed in our prior Introduction to the Internet of Things chapter. Only now, we'll also need to add variables to capture the analog responses from our sensors. I'll highlight areas in the original code where we'll make the additions. And here are the added variables. For this demonstration, I've defined two generic variables for registering an analog response from our sensor. The first is of the type unsigned integer called analog response, which will capture the signal from analog pin A0, which is wired to our sensor. I also created a string variable called myResponse so that I can convert that signal to a string type and then append it to the URL string that will result in Phona posting this data to ThingSpeak. Because I need to engage a new pin for registering the analog response from my sensor variable, I'll add it here. In this demonstration, I'll assign pin A0 to a constant called sensor1. Next, I need to write a function that will take a measurement using my water sensor. And here it is. I read the analog response on the sensor and store the result in my analog response variable. And within my loop, I'll call that function when needed. 
the sensor will be engaged via the sensor1 function I authored only if the conditionals checking on my phone registration status are good. Otherwise, there's no point in me taking a reading. Finally, I'll need to add the results to my URL string for posting to ThingSpeak. I do this by converting the analog response variable to the string variable called myResponse, and then adding myResponse as a field value to the URL string that will be posted to ThingSpeak for registering my measurement. Because cellular data is very cheap, I can monitor field conditions continuously by just delaying a set amount of time at the close of my loop before taking another field measurement for a data post. That's the advantage of cellular over satellite in that I can continuously monitor and report field conditions without having to jump through complicated conditionals to ensure my telemetry costs are kept in check. However, the limitation is that I may not have cellular coverage at all my sites of interest. One thing that you do need to keep in mind is that unlike our approach with satellite telemetry where field data is sent to a pre-configured gateway, cellular telemetry sends the data straight to the hosting website. This does require that you set your Internet of Things right API key in code for your channel of interest. If you need further details, please see the Introduction to the Internet of Things video for a refresher. With respect to the water sensor, this shows the analog response associated with the sensor submerged in a cup of water in the field. In this case, we let the water evaporate over the course of the next few days. And here you can see the response on the sensor slowly diminishes as the water level in the cup evaporates. Having said that, it's clear you don't really need an analog response for flood detection since the event is really just an on-off response at the given stage of your sensor but I decided to reference an analog pin in my code since this might be of interest when deploying sensors where analog data over time is of interest. For example, you can build a simple soil moisture sensor from a gypsum block hosting two conductors. The gypsum will act as a resistor when voltage is applied. When the block is buried, its moisture content should come into equilibrium with ambient soil moisture conditions. If the soil becomes wetted because of a flood or rainfall event, the moisture content of the gypsum block will change, causing its resistance to change. If this block is embedded in a voltage divider circuit, the voltage across these conductors will change as a function of the gypsum's moisture content. The voltage state can be measured by an Arduino, which in turn can be transmitted by a phona to a remote database or Internet of Things website like ThingSpeak. As proof of concept, this shows the analog response on an Arduino resulting from a saturated gypsum block being removed from a jar with water and then allowed to slowly dry over time. Either through experimental or subjective determinations, you could write algorithms that look at the slope of this curve to determine thresholds for when the block is determined to be wet or dry. This is only possible with analog sensors. It's more difficult to come up with such determinations using digital pins which simply come on or off when a given voltage threshold is met. And these blocks are fairly easy to build, requiring little more than two wire conductors, some plaster of Paris, and some flexible tubing that can be used as a mold. And are surprisingly uh, fairly robust, at least in the arid conditions that I'm accustomed to working with here in the desert southwest. In conclusion, I'll run through some slides that demonstrate how to build one of these stage functional water sensor hangers. I took some photos during a recent build and will let the photos speak for themselves.
That concludes this chapter for this playlist. I hope you enjoyed the video and we'll see you next time. Thank you.